Hi, I'm Andrew Tsao. In this episode of Backstory, we're talking about Great Speeches from a Dying World, a documentary film that takes a close look at the lives of homeless people living in the Seattle area. Filmmaker Linus Phillips got to know several individuals who shared their deeply personal and sometimes unsettling stories of hardship and addiction in this film. Linus, welcome to Backstory. Thanks for being here. I really, really appreciate it. Um, documentary filmmaking, y your own background personally, uh, you have uh, an experience as an actor with the Experimental Wing in New York at NYU, mm -hmm. and you also worked with special needs uh, kids. Can you talk a little bit about your own background as an artist and as an actor and as someone who's been involved in uh, what I would call a kind of social work and how that sort of informed uh, who you are as a filmmaker today? Uh, I, li I like um, when things play with reality or what's real and a acting does that, but I also like very different kinds of perform, you know, styles of acting and, uh -huh. and um, I don't know, I don't even think of it sometimes as acting, I guess, um, it's more just whatever, I don't know, this sounds hippie-ish already, <laughs> we just started, a way of being, you know, um, per acting and so like I think the documentary work, there's a natural transition or progression for me um, because it's like I just it's a way it's just like because uh, I'm you're always have a, a documentary there's always a scene partner yes it's just behind the camera you know like um, yeah and, and so I when I do that when I've interviewed people you just really try to be with them and yeah. especially in that film where I got to know some of them and spent a lot of time with um, some of the, the, the people in the film, you know. It you're, was you're, you're, you're kind of talking about the sort of desire for a, a sort of authenticity, a sort of truth, whether it's in performance or just talking with someone about their life uh, day to day. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> gaining trust in that regard has to be part of the process even long before I'm going to guess the camera's role. How did you build that trust so that that authenticity could happen? Different ways, you know, just time and yeah. walking around with a camera, yeah. um, you know, and a asking people, telling people your agenda, you know, I okay. think letting letting your stuff hang out, yeah, you know, yeah. walking around with your pants down yeah. in, in, a, in, a, in some sort of way by, uh, and then when you get to know people, like, I always try to, like, say almost as much about me as I want them to say about them. So are you saying when you first made contact with some of the subjects in your your film, would you introduce yourself already with the camera in hand or did you do sort of an initial contact? It helps to walk around with it. Like when so I they, they identify that. you right away. This is a person yeah. out here to do this and they could sort even of figure out what it'd be like. Yeah, even if it's not on, you know. Right. Um, uh, so I kind of got, people got to know me a little bit, but uh -huh. then I would meet um, people individually. Like sometimes I would just, like Tommy, the main character yes. in the film, I just saw him the first time waiting in line for food and he had a denim jacket and out of the pocket was Tabasco sauce. Okay. <laughs> and he just, he just looked great. It's like... So you just approached him and... Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and we started talking and then I would see him at the, you know, the different spots and, and um, then he started just talking to me like, because uh, he didn't want to be on camera. He was pretty adamant uh -huh. about that. And we're going to see that he ends up being a central figure in the film <laughs> from not wanting to talk on camera. Yeah, um, but I kind of wore him down. I think because he was just lonely. I, I mean, in some ways it's a manipulation uh -huh. <laughs> because I'm like, well, come on, if you want to talk, you, you uh -huh. know, you know, I'm doing this, yeah. you know, and so, I, you know, and it's the same for me. I, I, I get a... Um, a lot socially out of yeah. it too. Right. Well, you're you're in the film. We're going to see you've got uh, you know what I'd sort of call objective footage of of the, the you know a day in the life of a homeless person. Then you've got, as you say, a sort of relationship with them where I actually sometimes can hear your voice off screen talking with them and getting direct feedback. And then one of the unique features about speeches from a dying world is there's actually text given to these people to perform. Can you talk about how you shaped this, this documentary in that regard? How did, was it something that evolved through the making of it, you know? Or did you go in with these speeches in mind and look for the context as it was coming together? 
A little of both. You know, I had the idea when I, before I started, but okay. um, but it was just kind of that aspect of shooting was a train wreck for three months. Really, you know? in, in what way? It, it just you know like uh, I didn't know the people enough, and yeah. it was just so hard to get those. Um, uh, like I kind of I, I I figured out how to do it good enough so that the f speeches in the film made it into the film. And but those events happened. I'm gonna guess late in the process. Once all this trust and sense of familiarity was there. Definitely later. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I also realized like it was very hard for some of them to work on the speeches. So sure. I had to like also really know people's patterns like and 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 have a um like a good connection and and be okay if this guy is this close to the speech then i need to hang out with him for the next 10 days and hopefully in 10 days we'll try to shoot he'll be, it he'll be ready you know to do so it. it was kind of like that but but it was the uh, uh, the collaboration aspect of it which i think is important it's really nice because they didn't just feel like they're, you know, they have a journalist talking at them yes. and taking something and going. We're, we're kind of building something together by them working on the speech and us talking about it and how it relates. And, and they, they felt like we were comrades, you know, in the same battle. Well, in, in, in essence, what you kind of get a feel of is that by the time they're ready to do these central events in the film, they almost understand their relationship to the viewer because they're, they're addressing us in a sense. And, and it was very palpable and, and powerful in the sense that they understood, you know, they weren't just talking to a camera and the universe at large, but person to person, really. And is that something you had to kind of, uh, you know, explain or, or create in terms of, you know, what would you like to say to the world or what would you like to say to the viewers? Yeah, because the, when, you, when you say it, a speech like that, you're not talking to one person, yeah. which is an aspect of speech yeah. uh, or yeah. speeches, which yeah. is kind of great. You know, um, I think one on one contact is so special and has an intimacy. But there's something great because it kind of elevates you bigger than your own immediate yeah. problems and emotions. Yeah. And, and anyone can relate to that. Yeah. You know, yeah. you're bigger than where you are at in this, uh, you in your life right now. Yeah. You're bigger than your emotion of being depressed over whatever. Yes. You, Andrew, yeah. me, you know, anyone. Yeah, there's more to us. So they, there's that aspect to them, you know, even though they have their mm -hmm. issues with homelessness or addiction, you know, that to, to anyone loves that chance to be bigger for yeah. a moment, you know, and we all... I think organically feel that. So yeah, I think they really did. I mean, I picked the speeches, but some some of them I gave them a choice, you know, of, uh -huh. of, and they they had feedback on it. And you know, uh, someone like Reggie, who's the character, the guy with one leg in the film, he talked about the Bible a lot, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. and uh, he's kind of very Christian mm -hmm. in a way. Uh, and he he know he really feels that speech and we when we were like because there's different versions of the sermon mm -hmm. on the mount and mm -hmm. he does a little excerpt he was we were in a coffee shop you know and he was telling me like no 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 i it should be like this you know like he had really okay. clear you know so the investment was total at that point yeah, yeah even if yeah. they're not the most amazing performers right. in every line of it, it yeah. they they really did care about it yeah. So you, you're working with these people not only uh, uh, in their environment, but you, you're, you're spending a great deal of time. I mean, our viewers are going to see that you're not just taking one slice of life. You're coming back a year, sometimes up to two years later, and re, you know, sort of catching back up with the characters. What changed for you in your life during that process? You know, typically we think of making a film as a four to six week endeavor and we go out and we do it and we edit it, but this is something that took shape over a long period of time. How did the film change for you during that time? Well, I think f there's certain parallels with the, with the characters in the film, you mm -hmm. know, like it's a real search for dignity yeah. that the characters have. Yeah. And I think for me too, I was shooting for mm -hmm. my life at times, <laughs> you know, as crazy as that seems. But I was shooting for the the um, the, the quality of my existence. Uh, can you can, let's go let's go down that road a little <laughs> oh, bit brother. more? Hey, no, I don't have how to do go you to mean? therapy. This yeah, week. yeah. How do you mean um, the quality of your existence? Meaning you had you had somehow your own personal identity had become caught up in the making of this 
this film? I think it does with every project I do, yeah. Okay. Um, but um, fortunately or unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, so I think, I guess without going into personal yeah. stuff, it's details like... Um, I, I worked on the film and then I kind of took some breaks okay. and then I got back to it okay. and I just, you know, I have like a work ethic where I want to just make yeah. it, you know, right and and, um, and make it uh, like you're going all the way with it and especially with these homeless people I felt a, a certain duty. Mm -hmm. So, and it was all, it was nice, what was nice about working on the film so long was my relationship with Tommy really grew yeah. Yeah. and there wouldn't have been a movie if there wasn't if we didn't see his story progress yeah. as much as it did. Okay. We talked a little bit before we started, you know, shooting about your uh, relationship with the great German filmmaker, uh, Werner Herzog. And, you know, he is certainly a filmmaker who has uh, put his uh, physical as well as uh, emotional and spiritual life on the line in his career many times where he has, you know, gone to the edge in terms of what he feels has to be done to make film. And, and so I know exactly what you're talking about in that regard. Was he an inspiration for you in this, this uh, personal sort of investment in making these films? Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. with, with this and Walking to Werner, yeah. um, they're definitely like, wouldn't have been made if it wasn't for Werner Herzog. Uh, and, and he was, yeah, he was a real inspiration. And, right. and I think after my first film too, which was so personal, I wanted to do something else that kind of flex different uh -huh. skills as a filmmaker. Uh -huh. So that was maybe what I was trying to, trying to prove yeah. while also kind of just hunkering down yeah. into, you know, not worrying about that, but just yeah. doing the job. And, and Just so our viewers know, we're referencing Walking to Werner, which is the film that documents your literal walk from Seattle to Los Angeles to see the iconoclastic filmmaker Werner Herzog. So that gives our viewers a sense of what that, when we talk about personal investment, that gives them a pretty uh, accurate sense of what we mean by that. So, yeah. Um, now here's a look at the trailer for great speeches from a dying world. make sure she has at least a weapon or some type of instrument in order to make sure that she doesn't, the people accost her, that she can defend herself. Because I don't want nothing bad to happen to her, you know. She, like I said, she is a pretty good friend of mine. I like her somewhat. Ah, uh, he has told me some things that he has walked up on where I was asleep and tired from fatigue. And I had been violated so bad. That it just wasn't even cool. Well, children, where there is so much racket, there must be something out of kilter that twixt the Negroes of the South and the women of the North, all talking about rights. The state of white man will be in a fix pretty soon. But what's all this here talking about? They see that man over there? Says women need to be lifted into carriages and over ditches and over mud puddles and should have the best place everywhere. No one never lifted me into carriages, nor over ditches, nor in mud puddles. But ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arms. I have planted, plowed, and gathered in the barns, and no man could eat me. I could work and eat as much as a man when I could get it and get the last as well. But ain't I a woman? I haven't given up hope, but I've given up trying for a while. Linus, it's been about four or five years now since you actually spent this time to make the film with these people. 
Can you give us an update? Uh, talk a little about what has changed for them, um, how this film maybe perhaps has impacted their lives. Uh, what's the legacy of Speeches from a Dying World on the subjects of the film? Um, I, I think the people who were more positive that you see in the film yeah. were, were very proud to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, they might they might have felt a little uncomfortable at certain times, but. Um, I can speak mostly of Tommy. He, you know, uh, I think really liked, he, he would go to screenings with me and stuff and talk about issues. I think he, mm -hmm. he has a, a certain, um, like, affinity for the agenda of, like, kind of shedding light and, mm -hmm. and the injustice of uh, mm -hmm. how homeless people may be treated mm -hmm. or, um, you know, underprivileged people in general. He uh, recently, like I helped, I did a little fundraiser for him and, and got money for, to get his dog a, a knee surgery, so. The dog we meet in the film. Yeah, the okay. dog, yeah, so um, Gracie, but they're still together and okay. he moved out of the apartment that he was in, he found another place. Okay. And he's kind of away from the downtown um, area where all, he knew a lot of the people mm -hmm. doing drugs, so it's, it's less annoying and less of a, a possible trigger for him. You know, since the making of this film, interestingly, Washington State has just gone through, like the rest of the nation, and is still recovering from the Great Recession. And a lot of the characters in your film are uh, engaged and involved with social services and institutions that uh, you depict very clearly in the, the film. Do you have a sense of um, what impact the recession has had on their lives in terms of availability and access to services. Because we do know that in our, the Washington state budgets, a lot of this so-called safety net has been eradicated. I haven't lived in Seattle for the past three years. Okay. And Tommy and I keep in touch. Right. But, um, has, he, has he talked about this at all? Uh, you know, because he really. seems to be sort of on the point of that. I mean, he's, he's, in, the, he's in the film actually it's interesting because he's actually in the film as a subject of the film dealing with his own issues and he's very frank about them but he's also in the film helping others I mean he's out there advocating and he's he's giving advice and is that something he's continuing to do I think if he sees someone you know um, he's also a little bit more tired you know his health is you know not getting worse but it's just as okay. he's getting a little older uh -huh. uh, he just kind of keeps to himself a bit more, uh -huh. uh, which I think keeps him out of trouble too, because yeah. during the film he was he was helping someone, but while helping her with her addiction, that would sometimes make him relapse, you know? Of course, so, of course, yeah. Which is, a, I just, it's so endearing to yeah. me. Yeah. You know, it's such a, it's yeah. so human, you know? Right, absolutely. I don't know what else to call it. Um, so, I mean, I know the Downtown Emergency Service Center, which um, I had the most contact mm -hmm. with that um, out of the other organizations mm -hmm. that help the homeless. They, you know, I know are still there and okay. doing great. Actually, Reggie, the, the character um, who was not hooked up with them, but he did mm -hmm. since the film, mm -hmm. partly because I kind of just kept telling him to, and I think it, it slowly seemed to um, he was kind of paranoid about it, but he, he warmed up to the idea, and now he is living inside, which okay. I, I have a, a little bit of res you know responsibility for, just okay. for kind of telling him about it. So Well, that kind of leads me to a really interesting and sensitive topic about documentary filmmaking in general, especially when the narrative and the subject matter in the films are in a precarious situation, like the people we meet in in your film, and your film also pivots around those uh, wonderful speeches that uh, you gave to the, the, the people in the film, and, and it, it forms so much a sort of the grander um, sensibility of what this film is trying to do. You must have spent, and you probably still do think a lot about the ethics of documentary filmmaking. There's been a lot of debate about whether documentaries like this are helping these people, exploiting these people, um, it, it, using these people to facilitate a filmmaker's own career. I mean, I'm sure you've been asked this question too. Can you address that a little bit? Well, now I'm rich after making that movie. <laughs> okay, so, so, okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, just kidding. Right, right, um, right. 
No, um, I will say after some screenings, people would bring up the scene where there's this character Sarge trying to get over a speed bump in yes. his wheelchair. And they'll say, did you help him get over? Why didn't you just put the camera down and help him over the speed bump instead of just watching him up? Yeah, okay. I love it um, because <laughs> it's so funny seeing him trying to do that. Right. Like, I mean, he wasn't in danger. Um, and in a sense, I could almost imagine him saying, I have to do this every day anyway. I mean, you're not here with me, you right. know, 365 days a year, so why should we alter my reality? I mean, this is something I deal with. But I'm sure people said, <laughs> Linus, how could you just stand there and watch this routine? That's this what routine? I thought when I rewatched the movie last okay. night. I was like, why didn't I help him? And, and, but, but I think what's more interesting for people when they're watching that and they have that impulse, uh, that's good. Just yeah, let yeah. that sit with you. Yeah, okay. You feel the need to want to help. Yeah. You feel like that person should be helped right then. Yeah. Boom. That's, that's enough. That, that raising the question in, his, in and of itself. Yeah, and then they know I was there, so then they point it at me. Yeah. Well, it's, you do make a cameo walk in the beginning. Yeah, that it, it, the movie opens with me. With, with Linus walking by that woman asking for change on the corner. Yeah. So you do immerse yourself right into the environment right away. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that tension throughout the film is present repeatedly. And especially, again, when we have these moments where we jump out of their so-called reality and they're addressing the audience directly with these speeches and they are owning these speeches in a very powerful way I think specifically about the impact of the sojourner truth moment am I a woman I mean it's 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 so powerful a piece in that particular moment yeah uh, can you tell me a little about uh, bringing that character to that moment was that something easy was it difficult well Deborah is such an interesting character you know um, you can feel such empathy for her and, and yet she's just kind of so cold and honest about mm -hmm. her choice to to be yeah. addicted or, yeah. or choice to go down that road yeah um, which could make a lot of people not feel empathy uh, but that speech, she really liked it. It was so hard to get her to do it. A couple of the people did um, the speeches with an earpiece, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. feeding them the lines. Mm -hmm. And I would work with them a lot. And I would they were hearing my voice recording it. And I would try to do it. I would see where they needed pauses. And I would like make the pauses where they needed them. But mm -hmm. actually, there's only one that ended up where they used that. You okay. know, it was mostly a rehearsal tool. Okay. But she just hated that. Like yeah. I tried to do things where like I put it in her ear, but I would like mix in some jazz music or something underneath. She, she, she just <laughs> no, threw she, her off. No, really? she liked it. She was like, "Oh, I like the jazz." I was trying to do anything. Yeah, to, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, but she just like was very quiet and mumbling it one day. Yeah. And then she just knew it. And then like you know, and she's such a great performer. That yeah. Deborah, that particular moment also links to a moment where you as the filmmaker really step in and have that very I, personal conversation. Deborah, you are more than this. this, this notion of letting your light shine, letting the best of you uh, emerge. What was it about your relationship with her that brought you to that kind of intimacy in the film? I, I guess I felt like she was so truthful to me that maybe that was coming out, that I felt like I could say that. You could say that. And that was kind of something I said, like, yes, while well, keeping the camera still on her yeah. so I could use it, but it was also, there was so much shooting, so I kind of felt like it, it was more uh, easy for me to be natural and say something like that. Yeah. Um, although I was aware that it's kind of performative. I mean, I saw it, it was kind of a hard choice to put that in the movie. Because yeah, well, like I imagine you looking at all the hundreds of hours and saying, yeah, why would this you... is, yeah, this is an important moment. And I think it is an important moment because, you know, you've talked very eloquently about your relationship to these people and it's, and you know, your own personal investment and you feel it, you feel it in the film. You, you understand that, you know, when you began that, that moment with her, um, you know, in a way, it's sort of, you know, added a, if I can say, a meta layer to the film itself. You know, it started to become a life experience between the two of you that's being captured. Yeah, and I think movies or documentaries are kind of boring because they have so many rules about mm -hmm. what they should be. Right. Um, because they've all often taken the place of poor journalism in yeah. our country. Yeah. So 
they're kind of more journalistic by nature, but um, it's nice to see a documentary that, I mean, I'm, I like, I think it works because there's enough little moments, not exactly that one I'm thinking, but like moments where you really see the, their humanity yes. and not just like this agenda or about the issue of homelessness, right. but you see like these specific little human moments within kind of this this portrait of homelessness and addiction. So like, you know, just the guy, uh, Mark, who's stepping whilst, you know, and just to, the, just the fact that he, you, you would never think that he is aware, mm -hmm. you know, he's like, yeah, I hate when I step and it makes me look like I'm in boot camp. Like, it's right, right. so beautiful that he's yeah. aware of himself in this way, to yeah. hear someone talk about himself yeah. in some way. I mean, it's great to hear anyone, yeah. you know, um, have that kind of self-awareness. and. Well, it certainly transcends a documentary about homelessness to a, a sort of uh, a look into humanity on a, on a very uh, powerful level. So. Uh, uh, you should be very proud of that, I think. And uh, I want to thank you for being here to watch Backstory. My name is Andrew Tsao, and I will see you again behind the scenes. Thanks for being here. It was great, sir.